Coming up on the program, we're going to talk about one of the many, many issues we have had with our tomatoes. And we're going to plant some fall turnips and rutabagas. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored by the following. MIGardener.com, over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom, organic flowers, vegetables, and herb seeds, all for 99 cents. MIGardener.com. Sue Growing Supply, located in Wausau, Wisconsin, focusing on certified leaf compost, an excellent amendment for poor soil. With their new garden blend, improving soil structure in clay and sandy soil, great for creating new garden beds. Also available from Sue's, pre-filled trays and pots with professional potting soil mix or organic rice hull based potting soil mix. Bag and bulk of certified leaf compost also available. Visit Sue Growing Supply Com. Stop. Before you dig, call Digger's Hotline first. Call three business days before you dig. It's the law. It's completely free, and it's for your safety. Know what's below before you dig. It's your responsibility. Call Digger's Hotline or visit them at diggershotline.com. HappyLeafLED.com. Commercial grade grow light with a home gardener's affordability. No fans, no motors. Simply plug in and grow. Great for seed starting to lettuce to full grown tomatoes. All indoors. HappyLeafLED.com. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joy Baird. Well, one of the most popular crops, vegetables that people grow, whether on their patio, porch, deck, in ground garden, raised bed, or even indoor gardening, is tomatoes. And when you're outdoors like we are here, you have a variety of problems that will happen to, could potentially happen to your tomatoes. And we've got a number of them, but we're gonna focus on one today that is called the tomato hornworm. Tomato hornworm is a green-like worm. It's a green colored worm, two to four, maybe five inches long, and it has a hook on the head end of it. And what they will do is they will devastate your tomato crop. And we've got some examples of what that devastation looks like. And I'm going to pull this one off here. They will come in and they will just eat right about the time the tomato is ripe. Like I'm going to harvest this tomato tomorrow. You come out and that's what it looks like. You will know the... Uh, remarks or that the hornworm was there because there's black droppings and this is a couple of days old there's black droppings that that hornworm leaves and one hornworm can pretty much eradicate a tomato plant overnight these hornworms uh, live amongst the plants they're very difficult in my opinion and and in our opinion, to be found, we've never found one personally. We never walked up and go, oh, there's a hornworm. We've looked. Different people say you can take a flashlight at dark and shine on it and they'll illuminate. Haven't had that come true. Maybe I'm just looking in the wrong spot. But what they'll do is they'll come in and, and something of this nature, they'll come in and just eat away at your tomatoes. A Couple of things you can do here for next growing season is one, not plant those tomatoes in the same area. And then once these tomatoes have been removed at the end of the growing season, come in with a garden fork, a shovel, if you till, you can do that, and disturb the soil. Because at that point, later on in the fall, let's say October, early November, the larva from the hornworm has been laid in the soil. And there's little cocoons that if you dig them up in the spring, you'll find them that has been laid and they're at a certain level. And if you disturb that level, you have a very good chance, about a 90% chance that the hornworm will die off because of the cold temperatures. Secondly, you can space your tomatoes farther apart. We're in a Florida weave bed here and our tomatoes are planted about every foot uh, 16 inches. Pack a lot in this little area. We got about 20, 18 plants in this 10, in this 30 square foot area but also that can be a problem as well because they can very easily hang on the strings, go from plant to plant. That's it's what happens. What we found to work in the past, and it hasn't worked that well this year, but we're going to continue to try it, is taking posts and putting tuna cans on them, poking holes in the tuna cans and filling it with bird seed or old garden seed to lure birds in because birds have an incredible sense of sight in which they can see the hornworm 
and they'll pick it off. So that's another way to go about doing it. You can use organic and inorganic applications to spray your plants to try to kill them. An organic practice is using diatomaceous earth. You can get this in the granular powder form. Uh, we recommend from uh, Mantis Plant Protection. They have the cleanest, whitest on the market. Or you can also get DE, diatomaceous earth, it's also in DE, in a liquid form and apply it. You dilute it in water and apply it to your plants. The disadvantage to both of those is if you have regular rainfall, this will clean it off the plants and you'll have to reapply it after the rainfall. So there's some things you can do that way to help. Uh, also, one thing, if you know you have them and you're unable to find them, you can simply harvest your tomatoes early. Once you see a color change in your tomatoes, you can go and harvest them and let this set inside for about two days and it'll be just as ripe as it was on the vine. If you are fortunate enough to find hornworms that have white egg-like things all over them, that is from the Bracken wasp. That is totally a great environment that you have in your backyard. You do not want to disturb those. What has happened is the Bracken wasp has found the horn hornworm, laid its eggs basically inside or on its body, and the eggs are feeding off the internal portions of that hornworm, and the hornworm is good as dead. So that's a very good balanced eco garden, uh, very balanced ecosystem in your garden. So hopefully you don't have hornworms, but if you do, hopefully this information will help you either detour them or get your tomatoes before they get them before you do. Shallots are onion-like crops that grow in clusters. And you can start these from seed, or you can actually get them from your local garden center in the springtime. And we've got some here growing in front of our very nice looking celery. And I've pulled the weeds here, and they didn't do very well as, as expected, but here's a good example of what shallots will do. You plant the bulblet, or the bulb here, and it will divide itself into four, five, six, seven, however many clusters and these are a little sweeter than the actual onion that you would get or grow. Now, these work very well if you're going to do a soup or stew or roast. You can just throw the whole item, the whole bulb in there, and then you, when it's cooled down after it comes out of the oven, you squeeze it and it all pops right out of the skin so you don't have to do a lot of peeling. And if you don't like to peel, this is not the item to grow for you. So we've got uh, several different sizes and variations of them and you preferably want to go in full sun, which we have that here at the back side of the garden, and good draining soil, which we've had a lot of rain, uh, and try to weed free, which we have failed miserably at. So uh, our gardens are not always perfect, so it, it's the reality of things. But with this here, with these shouts, here's a good example how these are all grown together. It was started with one bulb and then it divided itself uh, somewhat similar to garlic, but uh, you take one clove and you put it in and it goes to a big bulb. So that's kind of what you've got going on here with your shallots. And mild onion, mild onion flavor, a little sweeter. And you can see this one here uh, had gone to seed. And that's what will happen. They are part of the onion family. So I'll just go ahead and throw that in there. And we'll use that one first. Just like if an onion goes to seed, it's not going to store very good. Now we'll just take these and clean these up and hang them in a netting bag uh, in the kitchen and use them as we need them. And in the spring, if we have any left, we go ahead and replant them. Some of these have been replanted for four or five years now. That's another one that, that went to seed. And we just continue to regrow them. Uh, preferably, we try to use the biggest ones, but if come springtime, we still have a lot, all of them go on the ground, and then we just deal with what we have as, as a harvest. Yeah, let's see, I got one more there. A couple more there. Nope, oh, that's it. So we didn't plant a whole lot. I think we planted like nine plants in this area, and we did get a nice little uh, cluster of them. Now, if we were going to replant them, let's say it was springtime, I would go ahead and grab these bigger ones, uh, break them apart, and plant the biggest bulbs, and then if I had room, I'd go with the smaller ones. So shallots, it's an easy crop to grow. If you have a little extra space and you want a different variety or different 
uh, type of onion. Uh, this is a similar to an onion and it grows, uh, multiplies and does very well. So we're in our front yard garden here and we've harvested our onions about a week ago. And I'm gonna divide this bed into two halves. We're gonna do rutabagas on one half and turnips on the other. Now rutabagas will take 90 days approximately to reach a mature state. Turnips will only take about 60 days. Now you can do this in the square foot garden method. You can do this in traditional rows. You're essentially wanting these plants to be about four to six inches apart which is a good uh, rule of thumb because these are gonna get as big as a tennis ball size and maybe baseball size at maturity and you're gonna have a lot of top growth. So the first thing we wanna do here is we wanna add some sustain all natural fertilizer, the recommended rates, and I'll work that in the soil. And then we'll go ahead and get our turnips and rutabagas planted. So I've got that worked in. Now what we're gonna to choose to do in this particular planting situation is go with just regular rows. And we're gonna space these rows about six to eight inches apart. And then we'll plant, we'll overseed our rows with turnips and rutabagas and then come back and remove the additional plants that are in the way just because it's a lot easier to cut them loose and cut them and pull them out uh, in two or three weeks than try to get them to grow and catch up with everything else. So all I'm going to do is just going to take my row, my, my triangular hole that I made, and I'm just going to space these. You're wanting to put these about no deeper than a quarter of an inch. Now if you get them deeper, it's not a terrible uh, crime because these things will want to grow. Too close there. These will want to grow and they will push their way through the surface here. So I've got one, two, three, four, five rows here. Turnips will take 60 days to reach maturity, and that's what we're gonna predominantly plant here. Rutabagas will take 90. At this particular time, 90 days is about uh, Thanksgiving Day weekend here in the States. And we are typically done with gardening at that point. Sometimes we've had snow on the ground at that point. So I'm gonna plant a minimal amount of rutabagas. Turnips, I'm gonna plant much, much more of in that. Um, so what I got here, uh, purple top turnips. Now these seeds, turnips and rutabagas, all are very, are, are identical in seed unless you know, you know, the, the container that you're getting them from. So you don't want to just pour them all in the same container and you want to space, and I'm just going to trickle these down, I'm not going to try to space them at all. I'm overseeding uh, by a lot. These are some older seeds, but I do want these to have the best chance. And it's just really very simple to do this. Now the, way, the reason why we choose to grow turnips and rutabagas in the fall here is because we've just not had good success with growing them in the spring. We have had springtime rutabagas once that was successful, but once out of about eight years, it's not a good ratio. And we've always found that growing these in the fall, as the days get shorter and the temperatures get cooler, that these work very, very well. And you can see these are the rutabaga seeds, identical to the turnip seeds. And again, I'm overseeding these. And with this good loose soil from uh, certified leaf comp compost from Sioux Growing Supply, they should do as well as the uh, onions did in this bed. So it's really that easy to do. Now I'm gonna cover these over and you don't have to put a lot of soil, just dust the, the soil over and then we will get these watered in and they will begin to grow. And now once they get emerged and the seedlings are about two to three inches tall, I will come in and I will space and I'll thin them out. Uh, and it's much easier to do it that way. Make sure there's a little uh, height in the, the seedling and I'll probably just take scissors and just snip them off, not to disturb the roots uh, by pulling them up by, of adjacent neighboring plants. So rutabagas, turnips, we find it best to grow them in the fall. Thanks for joining me. Join me again next time for more organic gardening and food preserving. I'm Joy Barrett and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.